some just count tanks. Others steal blueprints for nuclear bombs. The Cold War is the battleground for thousands of spies and spotters. Both sides collected intelligence in order to avert what was considered to be a looming war. The secret services have few scruples when it comes to procuring intelligence. They pay for acts of treason which may spell death for those exposed. Do I have an awareness of blood guilt? No, no I didn't. They were spooks with a license to spy. The men of the Allied military liaison missions in Germany were at the forefront of the intelligence war between East and West. Yet even today, hardly anything is known about their feats. No other Western intelligence service got as close to Soviet military equipment. But where there are secrets, there's danger too. We knew that Soviet sentries were trigger happy. They tended to shoot first and ask questions later, if at all. Klashnikov stuck in my neck, okay, so you don't move, okay. The risks were pretty enormous. In fact, how on earth I'm still alive, in fact, how on earth any of us are still alive, I have no idea. They were friends. And I understand what it takes to, to lose a friend, a close friend of this matter. It's a tour that brings back memories to three Cold War veterans. White gloves would have been reserved for parades, since their targets were out in the field. Their job was military intelligence, their brief, covert observation. Lawrence G. Kelly, a former US Marine, Jean-Paul Staub of the French Army, and Nigel Dunkley of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. They're browsing through dossiers that were once top secret. We actually served as a kind of carpet sweeper, vacuuming up everything that might be relevant, because we never knew until the end what was most important. The threat posed by Soviet military power is precisely documented in the old files. It's familiar stuff to Staub and Dunkley. Both men were tank experts. As only close-up photographs would do, they had to sneak up to their targets. A risky business. Shots from a film showing the British military mission in action. A tank crew has spotted the snoopers. A soldier is approaching fast to apprehend them. It's only by a hair's breadth that the Brits succeed in getting away. Sometimes they take even greater risks. Like when they were inspecting the inside of a tank. They climbed onto the tank, opened the hatch, and were stunned to see that the crew was asleep inside. So they very gingerly closed the hatch, dismounted the tank, and made their getaway. The officers of the military missions are out to get at the military secrets hidden deep inside the GDR, the Soviet-controlled eastern part of Germany. Their weapons, cameras with special lenses. The missions had been established due to an agreement between the Allied powers of World War II, the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. That was back in 1944. Procedures were implemented the following year after Hitler and Germany had been defeated. The intention had not been to create an intelligence apparatus, but to use the missions as relays between the supreme commands in occupied Germany. The reason for the mission to be established, for the missions to be established, it's absolutely obvious, because uh, we had four headquarters, four commands in Germany, and they had to communicate, they had to liaise. There are countless issues to take care of across the occupation zones. Provisioning the populace, coping with millions of refugees, tracking down war criminals, 
and the repatriation of POWs. So the missions had a semi-diplomatic, semi-military brief, with a view to getting the Allied administration of the four zones working as well as possible. Yet with the advent of the Cold War, the victors soon turn into adversaries. The missions begin using their status to collect military intelligence. The Western Allies make forays into the former Soviet zone, now the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, while their Russian counterparts roam the newly founded Federal Republic. It's an explosive game, part diplomacy, part espionage. There are some restricted areas which are off limits. As for the rest, it's thou shalt not be caught. Since their official duty is still to liaise between the occupation powers, the members of the missions enjoy special privileges. They had the same status as diplomatic couriers. Otherwise, they had complete diplomatic immunity. You cannot search them, you cannot detain them. So, too many things. And uh, they had free uh, travel uh, possibilities throughout the country. So, Americans, Britons and Frenchmen, each accredited by the Supreme Command of the Soviet Army, are entitled to regular forays into East Germany. The Western missions are based in Potsdam, near Berlin. 63 of their members are officially listed for the so-called tours under diplomatic status. The Soviets set up their respective camps in the former American, British and French zones of occupation in Western Germany. Both sides soon make use of their diplomats in field dress to systematically spy on the other side. Their observations are a welcome addition to the output of classical espionage. The most sensitive area during the early years of the Cold War is nuclear research. At this stage, only the USA has the capability of delivering an A-bomb. Yet spies such as Klaus Fuchs, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, or Rudolf Abel are risking their lives enabling the USSR to become a nuclear power. August 1945, Americans celebrate the victory over Japan and the end of World War II. Three weeks later, a Soviet cipher clerk in Canada switches sides. When they debrief him, Western counterintelligence experts are alarmed. For the rest of his life, Igor Guzenko will only appear in public heavily masked. The defector has good reason to fear the revenge of the KGB, since he has alerted Washington to the presence of countless Soviet moles in American institutions. Kuzenko was a key figure in a process which could be described as the discovery of the Soviet Union as an aggressive expansionist dictatorship. His interrogation helped expose a network within the Canadian, but most of all within the US administration, whose branches, and I mean nearly all of them, were infiltrated by communists. The Guzenko file triggers an all-out counter-spy offensive against suspected communists throughout the United States. The secrets of the nuclear program are at stake, especially since American engineers are testing ever more powerful bombs over the Pacific Ocean.
Possession of the A-bomb is crucial for the balance of power during the Cold War. As long as the United States is the sole nuclear power, its position is nearly unchallengeable. From the American perspective, it's a state of affairs best kept that way as long as possible. In 1950, the FBI exposes a spy ring centered around Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. The couple had passed secret information about the American nuclear program on to the Soviet Union. The Rosenbergs themselves were comparatively small fry. Their prominence is mostly due to their spectacular trial and its circumstances. The prosecution succeeded in presenting a star witness from inside the spy ring, Rosenberg's brother-in-law. To save his own skin, he testified, and this, of course, meant that others would take the rap. David Greenglass, Julius Rosenberg's brother-in-law, had provided the secret documents. Yet there are other, more important nuclear spies working for Moscow. In 1949, the Soviets successfully test a nuclear device. Without their American informers, they might have needed several years more of their own research. Their most important source of information is Klaus Fuchs, an exiled German physicist working for the Manhattan Project, America's nuclear program, and a member of the German Communist Party since 1933. In 1949, by then in Britain, he comes under suspicion. He hands himself in and is sentenced to 14 years in prison. The explanation for this comparatively light sentence, far below the death penalty, is quite simple. Fuchs had committed treason, yes, but the beneficiary of his betrayal had been an allied power since, from 1941 until the end of the war, the USSR had been fighting on the side of Britain. An extenuating cause that is denied to the Rosenbergs. They are executed for having spied for the new arch-enemy of the United States. The verdict on Mrs. Rosenberg was a judicial crime. She should never have been sentenced to death since her involvement had been a relatively minor one. But the court was determined to set an example. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg had paid their debt to society with their lives. Their execution is portrayed as a fitting punishment for having betrayed the United States. Nineteen eighty five. US military spotters on tour in East Germany, keeping a low profile while trying to catch a glimpse of the Soviets' brand new main battle tank. Stalking a tank had its risks. Watching videos from the 80s, military mission veterans Dunkley, Kelly and Stobe recall what it was like to sneak up on their prey. A Soviet-built T-80, a prime catch. T-80 was hot. T-80 was the brand new tank and it was the pride and joy of the Soviets at the time. And it was a pretty bad shock for NATO to discover it was good. It was an outstanding tank. The fire control system of the T-80 was very important as well. Tank modernization in GSFG was well underway, and this was a critical aspect of it. Major Arthur D. Nicholson and his driver, Jesse Schatz, are approaching a tank firing range near Ludwigslust in northeast Germany. We knew that Soviet sentries were trigger happy. They tended to shoot first and ask questions later, if at all. Yet Nicholson has set his mind on the tank's hangars, which are next to a restricted area. The two men scan the surroundings for Soviet sentries.
Sometimes the area, the training area, I mean, was sensitive and sometimes it wasn't. But we all knew that a sentry was normally posted there. Lawrence G. Kelly flew attack jets with the Marines before he was posted to the American military mission in Germany. By 1985, Kelly is second in command. Nick Nicholson has become a good friend of his. Kelly knows only too well what happened that Sunday afternoon. Four months earlier, a tour of the French military mission had come under fire near those very hangars. Nicholson isn't in the least deterred by the accident. Quite the contrary. Possibly that could have indicated that something important really was there. And I'm certain that Nicholson considered that point. Hardly recognizable under its tarpaulin, a T-80. To a military spotter, a first shot is like a trophy. The Soviets had begun to deploy their most modern tank in the southern parts of East Germany. By 1985, there are rumors of its presence in the north. But there is no proof yet. NATO's headquarters want just that, visual evidence. Nicholson probably hopes to find it right here, near Ludwigslust. Nicholson and Schatz do not detect any sentries around, but there is one, a bit further off in the bushes. Nicholson advances to reconnoitre the area behind the hangars. Nicholson was proud, well-educated, motivated and ambitious. And in my opinion, he had an above-average affinity for risky actions. Whatever he may have seen there, he decides to retreat. But the sentry had indeed seen the tour, and relatively early. And he reported that fact to the guard officer over a system like a field telephone. Missia, missia, he said, a mission tour is in the area. And the guard officer asked, well, where is it now? And the sentry replied, it's gone. To which the guard officer answered, well, when it comes back, you know what to do. Nicholson and Schatz do indeed return, but the sentry doesn't know how to proceed in accordance with standing orders. And even if he does, he doesn't adhere to the rules. He watches on as Nicholson gets out of the car again. Then things get out of hand. Come back! Shots ring out. Nicholson is hit by a bullet. The sentry holds Schatz at gunpoint, keeping him from administering first aid. When a physician arrives an hour later, Nicholson is already dead. Schatz detected the sentry at essentially the same instant with the first shot. And he ducked. The shot whizzed narrowly over his head. Either the second or the third shot hit Nicholson's center of mass, below the heart and somewhat inside the ribcage. Sergei Savchenko remembers the events well. In March 1985, he is stationed in Wunsdorf, the seat of the Soviet Supreme Command in East Germany. He's an interpreter with the section dealing with the Western military missions. When I came, I think it was something like between 6 and 7 p.m. to the headquarters. I didn't have any idea what was going on. And um, I could see that everybody was excited. While his superiors hasten to Ludwigslust, he handles any incoming news. This way, Savchenko soon gets first-hand knowledge of what has happened. Uh, when they came to Ludwigslust, to the place itself, uh, of course, everybody was shocked because to see the body lying almost next to the, to the, to the vehicle and uh, to see Jesse Schatz inside and a group of uh, Soviet officers around. 
photographs that have long been top secret. It soon becomes obvious that procedures have been gravely mishandled. And not only by the sentry. If you put a sentry with a weapon, with ammunition, anywhere, according to the Russian regulations, it has to be a post. And this post has to be clearly marked on the ground, on the terrain. There has to be a fence or a barbed wire. There were no signs, there were no fence, there was no nothing. And the sentry was nowhere to be seen. Jesse Schatz is kept in the car for six hours. That is how long it takes Lawrence Kelly and his boss, Colonel Lajoie, to reach the site. Only to be confronted by Soviet officers with allegations that the Americans alone are responsible for what has happened. The argumentation became incandescent with extraordinarily sharp accusations and the tension mounted continuously. The Soviets initially demanded to detain and interrogate shots, to seize and search the vehicle, and to perform an autopsy on Nicholson's body. The Americans reject the Soviet demands. They merely agree to a joint autopsy. Nicholson's body was transported back to a Soviet morgue in Potsdam in a Soviet ambulance, and I escorted him. Colonel LaJoy had given me the mission of ensuring that Nicholson's body was accorded the proper respect. It's a somber drive to Potsdam. Kelly is cowering inside the Soviet ambulance next to his friend's body. Underway, I looked at Nicholson again and again and mentally asked him each time, Nick, how could this possibly have happened? The death of Major Nicholson turns into a major incident. His coffin is transported back to the United States, observing full military honors. Nicholson is survived by his wife and their only child. The government pays its respects to him as a fallen hero. Major Arthur Nicholson was an outstanding officer, murdered in the line of duty. We grieve with his wife and small daughter. We can only hope that the Soviet Union understands that this sort of brutal international behavior jeopardizes directly the improvement in relations which they profess to seek. Our deep sympathy goes to all his friends and relatives. May he rest in peace. Three years will pass until the Soviet authorities half-heartedly acknowledge their responsibility for the shooting of an American officer in peacetime. I said to myself, why cannot we admit that the soldier was not the best soldier in the Soviet army? And in fact, he was not the best soldier in the Soviet army. If we admit that, then we can say to the Americans, we're sorry it happened, but it happened because we had a bad soldier and because we had an inadequately organized post. That's it. It will not affect the relation between our countries because in any army you can find a bad soldier. Due to their briefs, Savchenko and Kelly meet regularly. As interpreters for their respective top brass, they even begin to appreciate each other. Yet for Lawrence Kelly, the tragic death of Nick Nicholson still casts a long shadow. It's, it's dramatic, and uh, I understand the reason why Larry Kelly speaks about all that with such passion. They were friends, and I understand what it takes to, to lose a friend, a close friend, for this matter. Major Arthur Nicholson paid with his life for trying to photograph a Soviet tank. The Allied Museum in Berlin. Lawrence Kelly, Jean-Paul Stobe and Nigel Dunkley stand in front of a display case remembering Jesse Schatz. The tragedy near Ludwigslust affected him badly. 
Up until then, he was known as an easygoing guy, full of clever ideas. Like hawking so-called Berlin watches to tourists. Larry Kelly still recalls the details. Schatz was a natural-born wheeler dealer. He peddled trinkets of various kinds in the mission and at flea markets all over Berlin. Souvenirs mostly, sometimes watches. Problem was that his business, as he performed it, was only marginally legal, if at all. And the command ultimately told him to cease and desist. Former Staff Sergeant Schatz died in 1996 at the age of 42. A candy bomber. A reminder of the Berlin airlift. 11 dramatic months which marked the beginning of the Cold War back in 1948. Intelligence about the intentions and capabilities of the other side now becomes of paramount importance. Thousands of agents and spies risk their lives to bring it home to their masters. The airlift ensures the freedom of more than two million people. The Soviet stratagem to strangle West Berlin has failed. Yet, as tension between the opposing power blocks mounts, so too does the hunger for secret information. Both sides collected intelligence in order to avert what was considered to be a looming war and to achieve more safety for their own side. That's why, apart from so-called open sources, you'd want additional secret information. And that was the province of the intelligence services and the military missions. Thus, Berlin becomes the hub for military reconnaissance men, secret agents and informers of all kinds. April 1953. Seven British subjects return home from the Korean War. For almost three years, they had been held captive by the communist regime in the north. Among the returnees, here in the center, is George Blake, an operative of MI6, Britain's Foreign Intelligence Service. There may be no sign of it yet, but he has come back to work as a mole for the KGB, Russia's secret service. Three years later, in East Berlin, a 450-metre tunnel is triumphantly exposed by the communist media. Americans and British had combined to tap telephone cables on the other side of the Iron Curtain. The Berlin Tunnel was an operation whose sheer size was, and still is, without precedent. Planning included, it ran for more than two and a half years, and it tied up enormous resources in terms of money and personnel-wise, both British and American. Moscow accuses the West of a warlike act. The CIA and their counterparts at MI6 had driven the tunnel from west to east with utmost care. Yet Blake, blows the operation long before the tunnel is finished. For the time being, however, his masters let their opposite numbers carry on with their eavesdropping. The output seems well worth the effort. 50,000 magnetic coils of telephone calls, mostly between military stations. Even today, after many files have been declassified, the CIA still maintains that they were able to retrieve a treasure trove of information out of these more than 500,000 recorded phone calls. Yet why does the KGB let this continue for so long? Even if they managed to plant some amount of disinformation on the eavesdroppers, there are still several hundred thousand genuine phone calls for their enemies to analyze. Soviet intelligence had decided to sacrifice their own military secrets to protect their source, George Blake. This is the most plausible explanation. For the KGB, it's a move that pays off. 
Blake exposes countless MI6 operations, even betraying agents in Eastern Europe, agents he himself has recruited. In 1961, the mole's cover is blown. Blake is sentenced to 42 years in prison. In 1966, he pulls off a spectacular escape. His escape is basically an extension of his experiences in the war. He had been a prisoner of war in North Korea. He had had to survive under the most adverse conditions. There was torture, all these things. You don't know if you'll ever get out alive. But he had survived, and this had made him feel that he could cope with anything. He never ceased to believe in himself. To him, it was just another kind of war, and he wanted to win that war for his own sake. And that meant escaping from jail. Blake scales the prison wall and escapes to Moscow. What had made him a traitor in the first place? I wonder if Blake ever was on the British side. He was a Brit, of course, but in his autobiography, he states right at the beginning that he was convinced that the world in peace is only possible under communism. And that he wanted to contribute to changing the world order in this direction. Blake uses his occasional appearances in front of a camera to justify his actions. That his acts cost former colleagues their lives, this is not something he's wanting to hear. North of Magdeburg, a museum of Soviet trucks and other military hardware. Nigel Dunkley, Jean-Paul Stoll and Lawrence G. Kelly close up with their former objectives. Among them, the redoubtable air-to-ground missiles of the SA-6 series. It was the first time that I'd seen the SA-6 this close. It was an extremely powerful weapon system and definitely one of the best of its era. On the grounds of the former Soviet barracks, the three Cold War veterans look on with professional nostalgia as the curator unpacks the once closely guarded components. Electronic modules which set the frequencies at which the missile received its target data. Well, we would have been very happy to bring that back to Berlin. <laughs> Devices like these were of prime interest to NATO experts. To procure them was easier said than done. Analysts in various headquarters always had wish lists and justifiable wish lists, but they couldn't possibly know the risks that we would have had to run to make their wishes come true. Fulfilling some of them would have been tantamount to suicide. That's why the decision as to whether the potential results were worth the risk was left to the men on the ground. But the expert's eye detects some intriguing details about the missile's origin. I had my doubts because the color of the equipment, the lighter green, was not usual for Soviet forces. Soviet equipment produced in the Soviet Union and used in Soviet forces was normally darker. And indeed, Apart from some labeling in Cyrillic, there is faded lettering in Polish. To Lawrence Kelly, it's clear evidence that the missile originally belonged to a unit of the Polish army. His hunch was right. The Warsaw Pact Army's air-to-ground arsenal ranked high with NATO reconnaissance. Over Vietnam, as well as in the Middle East, Soviet-built missiles had proven to be a deadly weapon. Electronic countermeasures may enhance the pilot's chance of survival. Their development, however, depends on exact data on the setup of a missile. 
At the close of the 1950s, the Americans' U-2 is regarded as the ultimate spy jet. Out of reach for any missile, they fly over testing areas, nuclear factories and military bases. Their pilots regularly venture into Soviet airspace with a sense of impunity, photographing from a height of 20 kilometers. Until May the 1st, 1960. To Francis Gary Powers, it's just another mission. Yet this time, the Russians have a surprise in store. When the U-2 crosses the Urals, they launch their latest anti-aircraft missile. Powers is lucky to be able to eject and to survive the descent, hanging on his parachute. To the Americans, it's a most embarrassing incident, forcing them to cancel all further spy flights over Soviet territory. On August 19, 1960, Powers is tried for espionage by a military court. The Soviet authorities make full use of the opportunity to brand the United States as warmongers. Powers is sentenced to 10 years in prison. Three years later, another trial in Moscow, this time in the dock, Oleg Penkovsky, a high-ranking officer of the GRU, the Soviet Military Intelligence Service. He had switched sides and betrayed information about Moscow's nuclear potential, which had been cause for deep-seated fears in the West for more than a decade. Pinkovsky had access to highly sensitive material, but most notably about the development of missiles and their intended deployment. To the Americans, this was, of course, of the utmost importance. The cause of Pinkovsky's treason? He had felt slighted by his superiors. Penkovsky, by then a colonel, was expecting his promotion to general. He had had a fine career, but suddenly found himself at a dead end after a security check had revealed that his father had been a general in the Tsar's army. From then on, his promotions came to an abrupt end. His career was more or less over, and that's what made him break his allegiance to his country. In 1960, Penkovsky contacts the other side and delivers detailed insights into Moscow's military arsenal. Types of missiles, their range and numbers, plus information about the air defense system which blew the U-2 out of the sky. Penkovsky also warns of Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev's aggressive nuclear policy. Two years later, U-2 planes spot Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba. American analysts identify them as SS-4 and SS-5, which can carry their warheads as far as Chicago. Thanks to the information supplied by Penkovsky, the photo interpreters know exactly what to look for since each type of missile requires a distinct setup. And this was the pattern that Pinkowski had passed on to the Americans. Once their experts had found it on the aerial photographs, they knew that this was a launch pad for a specific type of medium-range missile. U.S. President John F. Kennedy imposes a naval blockade around Cuba. Should these offensive military preparations continue, thus increasing the threat to the hemisphere, further action will be justified. The world is on the brink of a nuclear war. Skillful diplomacy and a good deal of sheer luck avert a nuclear apocalypse. 
Penkovsky is arrested a few days prior to the Cuban Missile Crisis, tried, and sentenced to death as a traitor. The impacts of his treason are far-reaching. Both sides begin to build and deploy intercontinental ballistic missiles. Back then, there is no chance of intercepting them. He who shoots first dies second. Yet there are new, highly efficient tools for reconnaissance and espionage. Satellites orbit the Earth and capture stunning high-resolution images. In August 1960, the Americans launch their Corona program. Its satellites can monitor the Soviet Union without any interference from below. The capsules containing the exposed shots still have to be ejected by the satellites and picked up in mid-air. Both sides expend billions on their respective programs, but the satellites prove to be superb guardians against any surprise attack. The quality of their photographs improves rapidly. As a consequence, both sides try hard to conceal their secrets by camouflage. And to catch a glimpse, you need agents on the ground, just like the officers of the military missions in both parts of Germany. Each vehicle transporting sensitive equipment was issued with cloaking devices. Tarpaulins were a must, and a challenge for snoopers who would pride themselves on being able to sniff out what was underneath. Tarpology was an art form. In order to become a master of tarpology, you had to learn by heart every single type of camouflage used to cloak the other side's weaponry. We had to know what was underneath the tarpaulin, and so we did. Now, the Soviets had various ways and means of camouflaging and disguising their equipment. It was all part of what they called maskirovka, but they didn't fool us. In the end, we could identify virtually everything. Oh, yes, <laughs> we most certainly did even if they had to resort to cutting holes in the tarpaulin. Spy planes come in many guises. In the airspace around Berlin, the Western missions use small aircraft to peek down into Soviet army barracks or to shadow their opponent's field exercises. The air corridors to West Berlin, too, are systematically used for covert reconnaissance, focusing on military infrastructure on the ground. There are three corridors, each 32 kilometers wide. A fifth of eastern Germany can thus be photographed, practically without any risk. Yet there are incidents. The RB-66 is a highly specialized reconnaissance plane. In 1964, one of them shows up in the middle corridor heading for West Berlin. US Air Force footage gives a rare impression from inside the labs for high-end espionage hardware as it was installed in an RB-66 jet. There are cameras, antennae, sophisticated radar, jamming devices, signal recorders. Yet the corridors aren't meant to be spy lanes. Any suspected bending of the rules may lead to a dangerous encounter. In March 1964, Wolfgang Preisler is working as a chauffeur with the US mission when he gets the order to take a tour officer to the crash site of an RB-66 near Gardelegen, in the middle of a restricted area. A tricky proposal. The likelihood of being able to, uh, 
to stay undetected was very slim. Mm -hmm. So we, we knew that, but we did get within probably 100 yards, 100 meters of the, uh, the, uh, the crash site because we were able to see the, the embers. Chrysler and his tour officer are pondering how to best approach the crash site proper, since some distance off the area is crawling with soldiers. Then they notice something quite unexpected. The trees around them seem decorated as if for Christmas. A bunch of silver confetti hanging off the trees, and which was a little odd. And only shortly, five minutes after we picked off some of these pieces and looked at them and wondered, uh, you know, where they had come from. The RB66 had probably released the tinfoil as chaff in an attempt to blind the Russian radar, alas, without success. There was only minutes thereafter that uh, the Russian soldiers came and blocked our car from the front, from the back, uh, and they detained us for about 12 hours. The three-man crew of the shot-down jet are released a few days later. They had survived thanks to their parachutes. One of them, however, is severely injured. The Americans deny any allegation that this had been a reconnaissance flight. According to them, the jet had strayed due to a compass error, unnoticed by the crew. The Soviets are anything but convinced. Sergei Savchenko at the site of his former duty station. In his role as an interpreter with the staff of the Soviet Supreme Command in East Germany, he had become quite familiar with the routines of the Western military missions. Basically, we kept track of the activities of the mission members, of their pranks, their exploits, their deeds, his behavior. My room was number 13. The boss's room was number 12. In the corner, we had Mr. Lidomirsky, Colonel Lidomirsky office. And um, he was nicknamed uh, Colonel Schlagbaum. Schlagbaum because his service was responsible for the Glinica Bridge passage. The checkpoint at Glinica Bridge is the gate through which the Western missions enter East Germany to proceed to their assigned areas of operation. Every car is registered by the authorities. Whenever a mission tour passes the bridge, units of the East German state security are waiting for them. It's the start of a never-ending game of cat and mouse between the snoopers and their shadowers. On February 10th, 1962, the bridge between East and West makes international headlines. A few minutes before 9 a.m., two men are led towards the middle of the crossing. On one side, there is Gary Powers of the notorious U-2 incident. At the other end is Rudolf Abel, an illegal KGB resident in the United States whose cover was blown in 1957. Ironically, neither side was sure that the exchange really was a good deal. The Americans were gravely concerned whether Powers might, at some point, have disclosed vital information to his Soviet captors. Their interrogation methods, to which he surely would have been exposed, were notorious. Doubts were also fueled because he'd let himself be captured alive instead of taking the suicide pill he'd been provided with. That was held against him, as well as the fact that he didn't trigger the automatic self-destruct of his U-2. And so he kind of fell into disgrace. The suspicion that Powers might have talked, however, is not confirmed by later research. At the time of his arrest, Rudolf Abel is regarded as the most important KGB operative in the field of nuclear espionage. He avoids the death penalty, but only just. His sentence, 40 years in prison, may well have shown that he was more useful to his captors alive in the event of a future spy exchange. Seine Aufgabe war ja nun ein 
His brief had been to sort of resurrect a network of nuclear spies from the wartime period and to work as an illegal resident in the USA, behind enemy lines, so to speak. That's what the KGB had trained him for and why they subsequently sent him to America. Yet, it's a gross misunderstanding to see Arvel as this master spy. During the nine years he resided in the USA, he did not personally recruit one single new agent. The Americans had been expecting much more from him in terms of information than he could deliver. He just didn't know very much. So the famous exchange on Glienicke Bridge merely repatriated two men who, each in their own way, had disappointed their masters. But the CIA, as well as the KGB, had no choice. Those who let their agents down won't find any new recruits. The Bridge of Spies, a symbol of the Cold War. Time and again, Nigel Dunkley, Lawrence G. Kelly and Jean-Paul Staub set out from here into East Germany. They belonged to a hardly known elite of intelligence gatherers. Who roamed enemy territory. They don't think of themselves as spies. Their tours, they say, had been perfectly legal accredited by the Soviets. Some covert observation, yes, of course, but in a struggle for information, it's the results that count. And, as they see it, they managed to deliver. We observed the Soviets up close and personal, as the saying goes, and knew the realities of their armed forces better than anyone else. Our knowledge was practical, not theoretical, and we provided our authorities with an unbiased, first-hand, boots-on-the-ground assessment of Soviet military capabilities, which was very important at the height of the Cold War. Whether uniformed snooper with a diplomatic passport or top agent undercover, the bridge at Glienicke has seen them all. Intelligence gatherers on dangerous missions across secret fronts. East Germany in the 1980s. It's the deployment zone for 20,000 tanks. Another one, another one, another one. Since an army's heavy equipment is usually transported by rail, military snoopers turn into train spotters. They're brief to count tanks and to identify units. The men of the Western military missions like Lawrence G. Kelly, Nigel Dunkley and Jean-Paul Staub often lie in wait for days on end. The military missions had been established to sort out problems between the occupying powers in post-war Germany. Their members enjoy the status of diplomatic couriers, yet they soon use their privileges to spy on their opponents. The Soviets are touring West Germany while Americans, French and Brits roam the territory of the German Democratic Republic in the east. Their main objectives, the other side's battle tanks. A rail track north of Magdeburg. As the memories come back, Kelly, Dunkley and Staub decide to steer their veteran off-roader to the nearby town of Barleben. Once, this was a perfect spot for spies. Psst. 
certains jours. On some days, you could easily watch half a dozen trains going by as an armored division was either leaving for an exercise or returning. To Western snoopers, Barleben was a key location. From here, the rail track leads directly to Letzling Heath. Back then, this was the most important training area for Soviet units in Eastern Germany. Out of bounds for Western military missions. They could merely look on as the trains entered the restricted area, always under the eyes of the state security or Stasi and the FOPO, the notorious people's police. Sometimes we only had perhaps 20 minutes or perhaps 30 minutes at the most before the football would uh, be along. And of course, it was like a cat and mouse game. On most occasions, they get away. But not always. A propaganda video shot by the state security in 1978. A team of American snoopers is caught in the act. A tarpaulin across the windshield blinds the driver. A Soviet jeep cuts off the retreat of the mission car. Its occupants surrender. The license plate of their car is recorded and their spy tools are displayed for the camera. The missions are a nuisance for the East German government. Walter Ulbricht, the chairman of the state council, accuses them of espionage. Look here, this camera. It's 92 centimeters long, not exactly an amateur device. To Ulbricht, it's evident. The missions are reconnoitering targets for an offensive war. At least that is his interpretation of the maps they have seized. This merely confirms that the representatives of the US mission were especially interested in the areas of their envisaged military thrust. No state enjoys being spied upon. Yet in this case, there is no way to prevent it. The rules were based on the joint jurisdiction for all Allied occupation zones in Germany. Therefore, Ulbricht had to accept that East Germany couldn't act as a sovereign state in these matters and had no legal authority to prohibit this kind of espionage. In 1960, espionage is but one problem for the East German state. There is a virtual exodus of its citizens towards the West. The very existence of communist Germany is at stake. In 1961, its leaders decide to stop the bloodletting by erecting a wall. They don't care about the human suffering that will be caused by the partition of Germany. The Western powers accept the wall as unavoidable. In 1963, US President John F. Kennedy visits West Berlin. Nine months before, the Cuban Missile Crisis had brought both sides to the brink of a nuclear confrontation. But the most perilous days of the Cold War seemed to be over. Kennedy pledges to defend Europe's freedom with nuclear weapons if need be. East and West alike expand their strike potential. There is no defense against intercontinental missiles launched from silos or submarines. And if this were not enough, there are now several thousand tactical nuclear warheads deployed in both parts of Germany. Rod Saar, a Royal Air Force officer with the British military mission, lies hidden in the dark when a pair of headlights approach. It's a jeep. 
it stops. A Soviet soldier is checking the barbed wire. The slightest noise may give Saar away. Saar is waiting for Soviet fighter jets which are scheduled to appear in a few hours for practice attacks with live ammunition. He hopes to get some revealing photographs. Back then in the early 70s, Saar has a reputation as a cool, calculating daredevil. The challenge was really to get to these targets without being interfered with by the Stasi or the Soviets in particular, uh, to be able to get in close. So those, those were the kind of challenges you faced. But experience was an issue, so it took time to gain confidence and understanding of the terrain. Saar and his companion intend to hide directly beneath the jet's lane of approach. At daybreak, their cover must be perfect. Soviet firing ranges and bombing practice areas are prime locations for Western military snoopers. They are out to spot new types of planes and their armaments and to assess their strike potential. A Stasi guard has detected unwelcome spectators from the West, an interference Saar would rather avoid. You would sit under the flight line because the Stasi would not come under the flight line. They didn't want to have bombs dropped on their heads, so they avoided that. So that was the kind of different uh, a strategy. <laughs> Rod Saar, well camouflaged under the approach lane. To him, as an Air Force man, flight maneuvers are highly revealing. In 1971, he is watching an Su-17, NATO codename Fitter, when its pilot suddenly performs a steep climb. An unusual maneuver for dropping a bomb. What's behind it? Astonished, Saar continues to observe the plane. So the aircraft flew in at about 400 feet, low level, uh, and then it, it goes into a steep climb uh, up to sort of two to 3,000 feet, and then towards the top of the climb, it releases the bomb, which actually then is thrown forward. It then, in fact, in the end, rolls out and flies off at high speed. So it was simulating a tactical nuclear nuclear attack. And here actually is the uh, simulated nuclear weapon uh, underneath the aircraft. It was the first time that we had seen that and it indicated the capability for tactical nuclear strike by the Soviets. Even when the target practice is over, the range itself can be full of interesting finds. Parts of projectiles may indicate their caliber or the use of new metals. One day, Saar comes across a bomb in the shrubs, a dud. Obviously, the propeller of the detonator had malfunctioned. On the tour, I had two RAF corporals. And in a democratic sense, I said to these two guys, are you happy? that we take this unexploded bomb, it was about this big, back to Berlin. And they said, yep, fine. Yet, it's a long haul to Berlin. Will the bomb be stable enough to withstand one and a half hours on the notoriously cobbled roads of East Germany? In the end, they make it back in one piece and present their prey to their superiors. The brigadier suddenly was there and he said, what have you got there, Rod? Because we had a tarpaulin. Unexploded bomb, sir. Oh, he said. So <laughs> we went into the uh, Air Force operations room. <clears throat> we laid it on, the, on a long table. We took the tarpaulin off, and all my colleagues went. 
<laughs> so uh, um, then the uh, ordnance people came. They took the bomb away. <clears throat> I, had to, I was then going on holiday. Uh, I said, OK, dismantle the bomb. Uh, I want to take photographs, which I did. When I came back, they told me, well, this bomb was unstable. And please don't bring back any more unexploded bombs. End of story. <laughs> I wouldn't do it today, by the way. <laughs> Saar doesn't think of himself as a spy. They were mere collectors of military intelligence, he says, with the occasional foray into diplomacy. As in April 1966, when a Soviet jet crashes into a lake in the British sector of West Berlin, it's a Yak-28, back then the most modern supersonic interceptor of the Soviet Air Force. To Western intelligence, it's an opportunity not to be missed. The Yak had taken off in Finofurt, near Eberswalde. At the local Air Force Museum, there is still one on display. Klaus-Peter Kobber has dug into the story behind the crash. It was the starting point of an ingenious intelligence operation. The British began analyzing the wreck straight away. The parts still visible above the surface told them exactly what they had before them. And, being experts, they realized immediately that they should salvage parts of the jet engine and, above all, retrieve the components of the airborne radar. So, the Brits drag their feet. The RAF experts need time to lift the secrets of the Yak. The Soviets protest. The British military mission is called in to defuse the tension. As it gets dark, their stomachs are severely tested. But the Brits gain precious time for their technicians. Well, I had to drink lots of East German brandy with two Soviet Air Force colonels in their jeep. Yeah. And then they said, we must eat. And from underneath the seat, they pulled out this dirty cardboard box which had cold liver and garlic. Oh. <laughs> and I had to eat and drink this dreadful stuff. The stalling tactics pay off. Meanwhile, an elaborate effort has been launched to recover the Yak's vital components from the crash site. The divers floated them underwater, the, yeah. the engines and the, the radar, for about two miles round where they were taken out of the water and flown back to England for evaluation. Yeah. Having had them evaluated, they were flown back. Yeah. And the, the divers floated them back again, and one came up and said, we've found the engines. Yeah. <laughs> A whole week passes before the engines are returned. As for the airborne radar, the British claim that they couldn't find it. The Soviets do not believe them. Moscow is said to have ordered the replacement of all modules of their friend-foe identification electronics, as well as all relevant codes, throughout their air force. It's an immense effort, yet unavoidable, since the Yak pilot didn't push the button that would have ignited an explosive cartridge. This would have destroyed the radar set and the coding block. We asked the people at the factory who had developed those components what might have happened if the crew had survived the crash. They told us that they would probably have faced a court-martial, which might well have resulted in a death sentence. Since the crew perished with their plane, they escape any legal consequences of their failure. They are even declared heroes. According to the official version, they had given their lives to prevent their jet crashing into a housing area. Boris Kapustin and Viktor Yanov are buried with full military honors. Up until then, the only thing that mattered had been to get hold of the Yak's secret equipment. The surroundings of Potsdam have always been considered prime locations. A fact that the military missions were well aware of. Images 
of the Villa Colonel, filmed in the 1980s, when it was the seat of the French military mission in East Germany. La villa pour, uh, pour nous, to us, uh, the villa was a corner of France, de, de France. Uh, a place where you could feel comparatively safe. Today, it is used by the ambassador of Ecuador. The missions of the Western Allies worked closely together, and there were official receptions where everyone met. Like here, during a reception staged by the French to celebrate the 14th of July, their national holiday. Events like these are reserved for diplomatic small talk and celebrating peaceful relations. It was interesting to observe the Soviets from up close. I was very impressed by how much they could drink. Summer parties at the villa are considerably more relaxed affairs. There is a barbecue, and the members of the missions have brought their families along. Scenes of an easy-going life at the shores of a lake. No one would suspect that these men are savvy collectors of military intelligence, who in no time could switch from diplomatic niceties to covert action hot on the trail of their enemy. Sigurd Weber and her brother Jens are retracing their personal history. The banks of the Elbe River near Magdeburg had been their childhood playground. And it was at this very spot that Sigurd Weber did coolly approach a Soviet soldier to sound him out about pontoon bridges. That's now almost half a century ago, when Sigurd was a so-called travel spy for the BND, West Germany's foreign intelligence service. I knew exactly what information I was looking for. I said, Kuda, meaning where to. He looked at me and then he explained what they were doing, Stota, what this was all about. He was really quite naive. He just explained everything to me. Bridge-laying trucks figure prominently in the BND's handbook for spies. Engineer units of the Soviet army are a prime target for Western reconnaissance. How quickly they can cross a river is valuable strategic information. It helps to assess the potential rate of advance of the Warsaw Pact's armored forces. Sigurd Weber, her late husband, and her brother Jens were amateur spies. They were not in it for the money but had chosen to do their bit to overcome a state which kept its citizens locked behind an iron curtain. In 1954, Sigurd Weber and her future husband left East Germany and settled in Hamburg. In the mid-60s, they were approached by the BND and asked whether they would reconnoiter military installations in the GDR when visiting their relatives back home in Magdeburg. Sigurd's brother has stayed behind in the East and is by now thoroughly frustrated. In 1971, his sister talks him into joining their tiny spy ring. Travel spies were the BND's go-to solution after the building of the wall. Up until then, the BND had recruited stationary watchers. These were citizens of East Germany who lived close to barracks or training areas and would therefore have some insights into what was going on there. They would document their observations and relay them in secret letters or sometimes directly to operatives of the BND. The building of the wall puts an end to this practice. 1961 is a bad year for West German intelligence anyway. In November, Heinz Felfer, the head of the BND's counterintelligence department, is exposed as a KGB mole. 
It's a colossal embarrassment. The damage was enormous since the BND's counter espionage was practically wiped out at a stroke. It took years to rebuild the counterintelligence department to something even approaching a reliable working order. Felfer, who by 1945 was a lieutenant in the SS, ends up in the spy trade after his release from British captivity. He soon belongs to the inner circle around Reinhard Gehlen. World War II had barely ended when the former head of the Wehrmacht's Foreign Army's East Section offered his expertise to the Americans, who by now were keen to establish an anti-Soviet intelligence service in their zone of occupation. In December 1947, the so-called Gehlen Organization sets up camp at Pulak near Munich, funded at first by the US Army and finally by the CIA. It's the nucleus of the later BND. Its recruits include former Wehrmacht officers, SS men, and even diehards of the Gestapo. It's an old boys network, and security checks are mostly dispensed with. These people took their bread from anyone who would offer it. Their lives had been uprooted. Most of them were unable to build a career in the new post-war society. Those who had been professional soldiers had no future at all. There was no German army anymore, and according to the prevailing view, there should never be one again. So they took any offers that came their way. Retracking Felfer's activities reveals treason on an alarming scale. The damage is far worse than initially suspected. In their post-fact analysis, the CIA estimated that Felfer had blown the cover of about a hundred of their agents. As well as 94 German informers of the BND. In 1963, Felfer is sentenced to 14 years in prison. Barely six years later, during a spy swap, he is sent back to East Germany. Once there, he is resettled by his masters, becoming a highly respected professor of criminology. East German propaganda portrays him as a staunch activist for world peace and as someone who joined the right cause after an inner conversion. Ich I had to act the way I did. For me, it was about learning the lessons of the past. I had to join the side which, as was my conviction, could never be the cause of another war in Europe. A self-justification with scant awareness or regrets for the agents he left exposed and who the KGB may well have liquidated. To historians, Felfer remains a contradiction and an opportunist of the highest order. Presumably, he just sold himself to the highest bidder. He was a classic turncoat. To him, status was immensely important, the recognition he got. So his motives were neither purely financial nor purely ideological. A cynical master of deception and betrayal. A man who never queries the actions of his masters in Moscow, not even as Soviet tanks roll in to crush the Prague Spring. In August 1968, Moscow smashes any hopes of socialism with a human face in Czechoslovakia. Western intelligence services are caught by surprise. CIA memos had doubted Moscow's willingness to risk an invasion. Nearly 100 Czechs and Slovaks, as well as 50 soldiers, are killed. The message is clear. Moscow will tolerate neither reform nor opposition. An armoured recovery vehicle of the East German Army built on a chassis of a T-72. Time for some tank nostalgia on the grounds of former Soviet barracks near Magdeburg. An armored personnel carrier, 
the type Lawrence G. Kelly, Nigel Dunkley, and Jean-Paul Stoll, once spotted by the hundreds. In the middle of the 1980s, NATO could probably only have responded to an all-out offensive by Warsaw Pact forces with a nuclear counter-strike. The new T-80 was a formidable weapon, a prime target for military snoopers, and a most dangerous one. Somebody had the clever idea that we should find out the chemical properties of the new armor on such vehicles as T-80. Simple, simple, simple. They just said, it's okay, just scrape the paint away and then take a diamond cutter. I still have one, I still have mine. Sorry about that, I still have mine. <laughs> take a diamond cutter and then scrape a sliver of the metal away from the front glasses plate of the tank and then put it in a container and then take it home. In theory at least. Yet then, as now, fortune favors the bold. A British soldier on a Soviet tank, a photograph displaying secret technology with an apple showing its comparative size. A T-80 with a new kind of reactive armor Small boxes containing explosives which were intended to blow up any oncoming projectiles before they impacted. One of our exceptional tour NCOs, displaying a great deal of presence of mind and decisiveness, clambered onto the train, removed a small box of explosive reactive armor from a T-80, then quickly dismounted, re-entered the vehicle, and the tour sped off to West Berlin. It's a significant coup in the arms race between East and West. 1970, a military parade in Magdeburg. Jens Lick and Sigurd Weber are on a mission from the BND, counting military equipment. We'd been told to be on the lookout for missile vehicles. There weren't many to be seen, but we managed to spot some. They were all tracked vehicles with different configurations. We'd been trained to register if they were old or new, what type of tracks they had or how many axles. Monitoring the strength of the other side's forces is Cold War routine. Yet, numbers alone won't do when assessing the potential enemy's capabilities. To get a clear picture of his combat readiness, it takes observers on the ground. The city of Magdeburg is of special interest for Western intelligence. It's the headquarters of the Third Soviet Army. For travel spies, a ride on Magdeburg's streetcars is one of the safer ways to get a glimpse into Soviet barracks. That's line six. I told you. It's still running. Line six. The line is still operating. The barracks have long since been demolished. There was just a short stretch at the turning bay up there, where you could look inside, but only if you were standing. The Webers have been thoroughly trained for this kind of covert observation. They are not to take any notes. One of them will inconspicuously observe what's happening inside the barracks, while the other keeps watch for any security officers among the passengers. An ever-present risk back then. The state security, Stasi for short, had planted a ring of unofficial informers around any military object. They would count, photograph or film whatever went on. Anything that might be suspicious is recorded, even if it is only a car with a Western license plate. Taking photographs near military installations is strictly prohibited. Even passers-by are scrutinized. A mother with her buggy might be a spy, or a daughter taking a walk with her father while on a visit from the West. 
auf diese Art. This way, dozens of travel spies were caught in the act. Sigurd Weber and her brother Jens are arrested in April 1978. Her husband didn't come along this time and is spared the ordeal. It has never been precisely established how their cover was blown. Sigurd Weber suspects a mole within the Federal Intelligence Service. Her brother presumes that the state security had cracked the address they had used to keep in secret contact with their controller at the BND. The day we intended to leave, my car was damaged. So I drove to the police headquarters to get a complaint for my insurance company in Hamburg. When I was stopped on the way, I naturally thought it was because of the damage to my car. Some windows were broken, a side mirror had been ripped off. So I thought they had stopped me because of that. I had to leave my car and hand over my keys. I was coaxed into a Bartberg. The doors were locked at once. And there I was, sitting between two female constables. I refused to believe it at first. But then I thought, this is it. Days of interrogation follow. There is no use denying the charges. The Stasi already has proof. For Sigurd Weber, it suddenly becomes clear. Her controller's assurances that they need not expect any trouble had been nothing more than words. When my brother got 15 years, I said, well, that'll be life for me. But my interrogator said, no, we also chop off heads. Sigurd is spared the worst. Yet even a life sentence comes as a shock. She is unaware of any agent swaps and must face the prospect of life in prison. Everything was bad, but the isolation really hit me. Loneliness is terror. In retrospect, that was really the worst. There was no one to communicate with. I was always alone, in solitary confinement. And they knew that you can break a person's psyche like that. She is released after three years, thanks to another spy swap. The following year, her brother is sent back to the West. The Webers were hunting for the tiniest parts of the overall puzzle, mere ants in the vast world of global espionage. But there are times when a single agent can undermine the security of a whole nation. The treason committed by John Anthony Walker is considered to be so devastating that, after his exposure, he spends the rest of his life in prison. He dies in 2014, in the 30th year of his confinement. Walker begins his career in the US Navy and is trained as a wireless operator. He is then posted to the headquarters of the strategic submarine fleet. While he is only a tiny cog in the communication network of the world's most powerful navy, he now has access to the most sensitive information. He is working in the field of communication technology and cipher codes. In 1967, Petty Officer Walker begins to cash in on this highly confidential information. To him, it was a business. He was solely out for money, and there was no political or ideological motivation. He wanted money, and he knew that he could demand a high price. Walker's approach is as direct as possible. He copies some secret documents, drives to Washington, D.C., walks into the Soviet embassy, and offers the KGB a deal. Money, in exchange for secret codes used by the US Navy to encipher their communication. To the Soviets, it's a gold mine. 
they will be able to trace exercises of US Navy units, analyze overall strategies, and collect data about weapons systems on board. From now on, the Soviets will be listening in. And what's more, Walker also enables Moscow to pry into the holy grail of the Americans' nuclear arsenal, the operations of their strategic submarines who are prowling the depths of the oceans along secret routes, ready to launch their nuclear missiles. A submarine is a lone wolf, silently moving underwater without anyone knowing its whereabouts. That is its protection and, of course, also an essential element of nuclear deterrence. If this secrecy is compromised, that is, if an enemy penetrates the communication systems of your own submarine fleet, then all its movements would be disclosed, and the fleet itself would be next to useless. Walker escapes the radar of American counter-espionage for almost two decades. A man who sold the security of his nation solely for greed. When he is finally exposed, it's a revelation of nightmarish proportions. What brought him down was a purely private matter. His ex-wife, they divorced in 1976, feared that he would entangle their adult children in his spy business. And so she rang the FBI. To her, it was bad enough that her husband was such a nasty piece of work, but as she said, at least I won't let my children go to the dogs. For her son Michael, however, it's too late. He's allowed himself to be lured into his father's activities and is sentenced to 15 years in prison. Vietnam, at the end of the 60s. The US Army is engaged in a war against the Communist North. In its effort to contain the spread of communism in East Asia, the US administration makes but poor use of its intelligence services. Memos on enemy strength and morale are often nothing more than wishful thinking, while reports tend to overestimate the effect of American firepower in the jungle. Even highly sophisticated spy jets like the SR-71 Blackbird do not bring about a decisive change, although their crews run the gauntlet almost daily to reconnoitre North Vietnamese air defence and to identify strategic targets. the enemy defies any effort to bomb them into submission. In the end, the superpower loses the war which had claimed almost three million lives and became overshadowed by atrocities and massacres. The outcome is a bitter pill for an administration which had misused their intelligence services to supply its leaders with the information they wanted to hear. It's a busy day in the air above Veltso, south of Cottbus. That's why Rod Saar is there, along with his team. It's early September 1972, but the Brits aren't alone. Corporal Calvin said, there's somebody in there in this low pine. We're in low pine trees. I said, fine, everybody in the car, car locked, equipment away, I would investigate. Saar suspects them to be operatives of the Stasi, East Germany's state security forces. Usually the missions don't really care about them. They may call in the Soviets, but that would merely be a nuisance. My tactic with the Stasi was always to chase them um, aggressively. So if I knew the Stasi were hiding, I would run at them. And I'd run, I'd charge, and I'd shout. Uh, standard aggressive tactic. Uh, and this worked, they would run, they would go. But this time, the men in the bushes aren't Stasi. They are Soviet special forces. 
they changed their tactic. They used, uh, each airfield in the end had Spetsnia uh, platoons, so special forces platoons, and they would try and jump you. Uh, and their aim basically was to be violent. The Spetsnia, or Spetsnuts, are among the toughest troops on either side. Elite units trained not to back down. At first, they merely observe the British as they move about near the airbase. Then, Rod Sarr tries his usual tactic on them. They rose up. I ran back too late. I got me, Klajnikov, stuck in my neck. OK, so you don't move, OK? Got to the car, smashed the car window, knocked out Corporal Calvin, didn't touch the group captain, but stole our equipment. Rod Sarr is declared persona non grata by the Soviets. It's the end of his forays into East Germany. He has pushed his luck too far this time. A powerful engine is a trump card on the Allied missions tours. Superior speed helps to shake off any shadowers or, if need be, to make a getaway, be it on the road or on rough terrain. By stepping on the gas, you could leave the state security standing in the dust. Burkhard Mielke was among those who often came out on the losing end of such encounters. During the 1980s, he works for East Germany's Directorate for Counterintelligence. At times, they were speeding along at up to 220 kilometers per hour. With our Wartburgs and Ladas, we didn't stand a chance. The specially modified mission cars have a range of 1,000 kilometers, whereas a Wartburg would have to refuel twice to cover that distance. Stasi photographs of a mission tour filling up, showing the size of the additional tank. Cool and composed, these Allied mission officers channel the nonchalant spirit of the easy riders. Protected by their status and horsepower, while their eastern shadowers record their activities on film. Later on, we gave up chasing after them and set up reception committees instead. The missions must now reckon with Stasi units lying in wait along their tour. Their opponents know from experience where and when the Western snoopers will most probably show up. Every directorate was trying to impress the ministry. We said, today is the big day. We'll capture a mission car, get hold of their equipment and teach them a lesson. Every unit wanted to be the first to achieve this. And so we came up with a few ideas of our own. It had been decided that state security should no longer simply record the mission's activities, but actually prevent them. Unbeknownst to the men on the tours, the rules of the game had been changed. The driver's cab of a truck still arouses painful memories for Jean-Paul Staub. To this day, it reminds him of an incident overshadowing his years as a tour officer for the French military mission. Nineteen eighty four, north of the city of Halle. Three days before, a Ural, a heavy truck of the East German Army, took up position in a side road. It is apparently waiting for the order to move. Maintain your position. Everything according to plan. Roger. At about 11 o'clock on March 22nd, the Stasi prepares to strike. Its target, a car of the French military mission on its way to observe a major exercise of the Warsaw Pact forces in East Germany. Jean-Paul Staub is riding in the back. 
We did notice an army jeep coming up from behind. It seemed like he was intending to chase us. But we were in front, so we sped up a bit, and under normal circumstances, we would have got away. But it's a trap. Suddenly, there's a truck ahead of them. It's the Ural. And it's behaving in a most threatening manner. I said to Warrant Officer Mariotti, who was our driver, stop, we won't get past him. But I may not have been forceful enough. Anyway, in critical situations, it's the driver who knows best which decision to take. Both drivers step on the gas. The soldier in the Ural is determined to block the French car, come what may. The result is a fatal crash. Stills from the accident filed by state security. The truth is, Mariotti nearly made it. One or two seconds earlier, and we would have got past the truck and sped off towards Halep. But sadly, it wasn't to be. Mariotti died on the spot. I was severely injured, and our third man, Warrant Officer Blancheton, had a broken shoulder. The strike against the French had been elaborately planned. No less than three trucks had been positioned ahead of the French vehicle with a view to catching them red-handed in their illicit activities. I'm no lawyer, yet to me the term negligent homicide seems applicable here. They obviously knew someone might get killed, yet they went ahead regardless. After all, the cars involved weren't little Trabants made of plastic, but heavy trucks. Philippe Mariotti acted on his driver's instinct as he had done many times before. For once, he misjudged the situation. The French government tries to keep the incident out of the headlines. Both sides are pursuing a policy of military de-escalation. The death of a soldier must not get in the way of international diplomacy. He was buried discreetly without military honors. An ignominious end to the life of a soldier. Uh, pour un soldat. The garden of the former French military mission in Potsdam. In remembrance of Warrant Officer Mariotti, a memorial stone has been laid. His comrades leave their wreaths at the site of his death, an act that, too, is duly recorded by state security cameramen. Nigel Dunkley, a veteran of the British military mission, in a hangar near Jutteborg, a small town south of Potsdam. He's meeting up with Manfred Müller of the local garrison society. Dunkley is telling him about his missions, about reconnaissance tours in enemy territory at night. Manfred Müller has several items in his museum that were high on the British military mission's wish list in the 1980s. The officers of the Allied military liaison missions were constantly on the road. As couriers with a diplomatic passport, 
Their original task was to solve problems between the four occupying powers in Germany. However, they soon exploit their freedom by spying on their opponents, the Soviets in Western Germany and the Americans, British and French in the East, the German Democratic Republic. Each side is allowed to send out 63 men. An all-terrain vehicle is approaching a Soviet bunker. It is the early 1980s. The British are on the hunt for new types of ammunition that could contain biological or chemical warfare agents. The bunker should only be manned during military exercises. The intruders can't be completely sure of that, however. They have reached the room that holds the air filters. How these filters are constructed tells experts which warfare agent they are supposed to protect against. Nigel Dunkley takes part in the hunt for these filters. In Jutteborg, he sees the once highly coveted barrels again. Dunkley never talks about the background of his missions. Most of it is still top secret. He only talks about what he experienced. It was dark. I dropped the filter that I was removing. The guard heard that. His dog barked. And so I um, ran away as fast as I could. There's no other expression for it. NATO insists on speeding up the investigation. How are the Soviet filters constructed? What warfare agents did the Soviets prepare for in an emergency? Could it be types of agents the West does not know of yet? In 1982, at a military exercise area, the British get their hands on the first filter. The news of the captured barrel hits the Ministry of Defence in London like a bombshell. The filter apparently protects against germs as well, biological particles being scattered by grenades, for example. In response, NATO is said to launch a research programme to upgrade their own filters. Of course, we knew that anything that was important that we borrowed, as we would say, um, would probably pretty quickly be replaced. And so a few weeks later, we went back and there was the brand new one. That was the one that we wanted, so we stole that as well. <laughs> Afghanistan. Soviet troops have been occupying the country since December 1979. Moscow wants to break any resistance against the communist regime that has been installed in Kabul. The insurgent Mujahideen appear powerless in the face of full Soviet firepower. Attack helicopters dominate the battlefield. Yet secretly, the Americans are supporting Islamist resistance groups in Afghanistan. The war at the Hindu Kush turns into yet another theater of operations for the secret services. The CIA, as middle the American government, the CIA launched Operation Cyclone, which is one of the longest and most expensive CIA operations to date. Und teuersten Operationen der CIA bis heute insgesamt. In all, the cost of this covert program, which included arms delivery as well as economic aid, amounted to several billion dollars. This money mostly flows to Pakistan, the central hub for the armament of the Mujahideen. The CIA also supplies them with modern Stinger anti-aircraft missiles. The tide is starting to turn. With Stinger missiles, the Mujahideen can shoot down jets and helicopters.
Soviet troops sustained severe casualties. In the mountains of Afghanistan, the superpower's heavy arms are ineffective. The alliance of Mujahideen and the CIA win the war. The US bolster a partner who will soon turn against them, while the Soviet Union loses a lot of prestige. Roughly one million people die, 15,000 Soviet soldiers among them. Hind attack helicopters fly over East Germany. Scouts from a Western military mission observe a maneuver. The war in Afghanistan deepens the divide between East and West. Soviet troops exercise new attack strategies. The Hind pilots impressed me, and I was an attack pilot as well, albeit in jets rather than helos. They flew low, aggressively, and maintained positive control over the aircraft. I doubt that our helo pilots could have flown better than many of the Hind pilots that I saw. The military mission's task is to find out whether the Soviets are deploying combat units from East Germany to Afghanistan. They need to produce information no matter how they get it. The officers with diplomatic passports put on thigh-length overboots and protective gloves. None of them know what they will have to touch that night. They check their flashlights one last time. The barracks rubbish tip is their target. But they are not alone. The smallest noise could give the scouts away and alert the guard. Examining rubbish tips at night was part of the British Operation Tomahawk, activities which had been classified top secret until just recently. A noise alerts the guard. The snoopers scan the area. Could there be a second guard? It is just a stray dog. All clear. However, scouts feared dogs on night missions, as Nigel Dunkley remembers. There were quite often wild dogs out on the rubbish tips. These dogs scared me, and I don't mind admitting it. One of them, I remember, came up to me, like they often did, and started uh, sniffing around my leg. And I thought, this dog must have rabies, it's not acting properly. A single dog can put the men in danger. After half an hour, the guard finally gets in his jeep and drives off. With the way to the rubbish tip clear, the British scouts are hoping for discarded data sheets on tanks, duty rosters, notepads, and maybe evidence for missions in Afghanistan. Instead, they find rotting kitchen waste. While methodically feeling around for something useful for their analysts, they get lucky. A grubby postcard with a field post number. They know that such numbers are the key to an army's structure and to its order of battle in the event of war. Soldiers have numbers, just like the units they serve in and the tanks they are scheduled to fight in in an emergency. That's routine business to the military missions. A seemingly endless roster of digits on tens of thousands of vehicles that is often boring but important. Heavily armed men are protecting a visitor to the cemetery. Ryszard Kuklinski, a former officer and traitor in the general staff of the Polish army, fears a revenge attack. He is visiting his parents' grave in 1998 one year after his death sentence for treason has been reversed 
and he has been rehabilitated. Richard Kuklinski passed on documents on the Warsaw Pact to the Americans for nine years, from 1972 to 1981. With these almost 350,000 photographed documents, he provided the Americans with in-depth knowledge on the Soviet side of the Warsaw Pact. Kuklinski contacts the CIA in the hopes of reducing the risk of a nuclear war. A war in which Poland would become a battlefield as well. He reveals military installations and strategies of the Warsaw Pact. The Americans were wondering whether the Soviet nuclear arsenal was intended to serve as a threat or whether they would use it in an attack on Western Europe. And Kuklinski's documents indicated that the Russians were indeed using their nuclear potential offensively as well. Poland in the late 1970s. The labor union Solidarity is challenging the communist regime. Kuklinski cautions against a Soviet invasion into Poland, reporting plans to declare martial law to the CIA. When it is finally imposed in December 1981, the defector has already escaped to the United States. Hiding in boxes, Kuklinski, his wife, and their two sons are smuggled out of the country via East Berlin by the CIA. In a transporter, disguised as diplomatic baggage, they escape at the last minute. In 1984, he was sentenced to death in absentia. The sentence was not reversed until 1997, long after the Warsaw Pact had been disbanded and Poland was no longer a communist country. Kuklinski was controversial because there was dispute over Poland's status in the Cold War. Was it a sovereign state? If so, Kuklinski would have betrayed Poland and could be considered a traitor even today. Or was it just a puppet of the Soviets and Kuklinski had therefore only betrayed the occupying power. Richard Kuklinski does not fall prey to an act of revenge. In 2004, he dies of a stroke in his exile in the US. To the present day, he is a controversial figure in Poland. The Warsaw Pact is not the only victim of a master spy, however. NATO is as well. This spy's employer is the Ministry for State Security of the GDR, the Stasi. His code name is Topaz, his real name is Rainer Rupp. As a spy, he makes no mistakes. It is not until 1993 that he is arrested and put on trial. Rupp had been releasing top secret documents on NATO's military strategy and armament plans to East Germany since 1977. Rainer Rupp. Rainer Rupp had access to documents you can only dream of, key documents from NATO headquarters. They were so fantastic, the Ministry of State Security immediately passed them on to the KGB the minute they received them. Rupp is a spy by political conviction. He is sentenced to 12 years on charges of high treason which could have been disastrous in the case of a conflict, as the opinion of the court stated. NATO is working towards its nuclear rearmament in the late 1970s, yet nobody suspects Moscow to have gained this intelligence via its mole, Topaz. Nigel Dunkley, on the premises of a former military hospital in Berlitz, a place that still haunts him. About 30 years ago, he was secretly rummaging through the trash from the operating theatres. It was a sickly, sweet, disgusting, rotten smell. The Baylitz sanatoriums were built in the late 19th and early 20th century. After World War II, the Soviets move in. In the 1980s, the military mission's interest in hospitals of the Soviet military is growing. That's especially true for the British who are hoping that, in Baylitz, they will gain new information 
on the war in Afghanistan. The Soviets suffer severe casualties in the Hindu Kush. It is quite possible that some of their wounded were treated in Germany as well. The British want to get to the bottom of that assumption. That is why Dunkley is sent to Baylitz on some of the most depressing field trips he has ever been on. The military missions did not have access to the sanatorium itself, only to its rubbish tip. Coming back to this place after all these years still is a very emotional experience. When I think of what happened here, when I think of what went on, the number of people who suffered here from the Soviet army, for me still, all these years later, it is still a very, very moving experience. The operating theaters lie in ruins, but it only takes a few of the remnants to send Dunkley back on a journey through time. A medicine cabinet in the anesthesia department provides a window into the past. Wow, absolutely amazing to find these medicines here. Dunkley contemplates the fate of patients and the work of the doctors. It's extraordinary to think that while the Russians were doing their surgical preparation in here, in the operating theater, we, at the same time, are, are out there waiting for the blood-stained bits of uniform, for the bandages covered in mess and bits and pieces, body parts even, from time to time. We're waiting there, as it was described, like vultures on a branch. For hours, they are on standby at the disposal site. They want to know where the fresh bags are being dumped. As soon as the dust cart leaves, their work starts. Dunkley discovers remains of amputated tissue in a boot a find that upsets him. I did this for two and a half years. You can't do this kind of stuff without, after a while, it has an effect on you. You begin to think in your quieter moments what you have found, and then you begin to wonder about the fate of the young person whose jacket pocket you looked through. Going through waste is hardly a new method in the business of espionage. That the missions employ it as well remains a well-kept secret for quite some time. They are rummaging for papers and letters, systematically looking for them in the pockets of discarded uniforms. In a uniform jacket pocket, there was this letter that said, Dadagaya Mat, dear mum, Dear mother, I think I'm the last one left. We were attacked recently. It was terrible. I think I'm the only survivor of that ambush by the Taliban. And that had a really big impact when you start to think, what happened to the soldier? Because the letter was never finished. How many soldiers who were wounded in Afghanistan were treated in Baylitz is disputed. There probably were individual cases, Soviet soldiers who had been detailed there from East Germany. Hospital waste can reveal quite a lot, even without war wounded, about medical standards or protection against infections. All of that is relevant for the combat strength of an army. In the late 1970s, the Cold War undergoes its next dangerous escalation.
Each SS-20 carries three nuclear warheads and could reach any location in Western Europe from Russia. A nuclear conflict confined only to Europe is looming. It might be an alternative for the superpowers, but it would mean the end for Germany. In West Berlin, the ruin of a listening post shrouded in mystery is rotting away. Its protective sheathing in tatters, its antennae dismantled. Helmut Müller-Enbergs, an expert on secret services, is imagining the babble of voices on the airwaves that the spies on the Teufelsberg, the Devil's Hill, used to listen to. They don't know what's happening in the east, but from this location, they can take a peek at the desks of their enemy, so to speak. Where are tanks being moved? Where are maneuvers being conducted? What is going on? The Americans and the British use Teufelsberg as a base for spying. 1,500 personnel intercept, translate and analyze in shifts. Their antennae pick up communications several hundred miles away. If there hadn't been sources or agents of the Stasi here, we probably still would not know who was on duty here or how many of them there were, and we wouldn't know what was recorded. Teufelsberg is one station in a global network operated by the National Security Agency, or NSA. An effective squad of eavesdroppers that, in the early 80s, is still top secret. However, that is about to change. With James William Hall, a US soldier working at Teufelsberg. In 1982, Hall begins passing on secret documents on the American eavesdropping operations to the KGB and the Stasi. Among them were long lists of the NSA's targets. Paul's photocopier is running hot. He and his associate are said to wear sunglasses so they can keep the copier's lid open and therefore work faster. Even a classified document with the code name Canopy Wing is sent to East Berlin that way. Canopy Wing? Canopy Wing has to be the best piece of intelligence the Stasi was ever able to gather. Unfortunately, we cannot read the documents today. We only have their projections, statements, and hints about them. But with all the speculation combined, we can assume that the state security service had the ingredients required for a preemptive nuclear strike. In Händen gehalten. They had a strategy for electronic combat. Hall betrays how NATO would communicate in the case of an emergency and how they want to disrupt the Warsaw Pact's communications. The Stasi describes how the West wants to manipulate radio communications between pilots and control centers on the ground. Strategies that must have been unsettling for Moscow. In the chaos surrounding the Stasi's files after the reunification of Germany, insiders secure the Canopy Wing documents. In 1992, the Kohl administration hands them over to the US without causing a stir. Hall's cover is blown in 1988, and he is sentenced to 40 years in prison. Jeffrey Carney betrays the NSA as well. He doesn't do it for money, but for conscientious reasons. His punishment, 38 years in prison. He is released after almost 12 years. In 1983, Carney is a soldier in the Air Force, stationed at the NSA field site in Marienfelde, Berlin. That is where he learned about operations which still disgust him today. 
We didn't simply want to provoke the sleepy guys on the other side to see what they would do. We actually wanted to set off the alarm, literally the alarm. For those who don't know, that means we were planning to provoke the Russians into thinking it was the real thing. Think about what that means. An actual alert. 1983, the Cold War, Abel Archer. Abel Archer. Carney provides only vague hints, no details. He might have to go back to prison if he were more specific. The command post exercise, Abel Archer, is the highlight of the annual autumn maneuvers. Just like every year, NATO practices the defense of Western Europe against an attack. The deployment of troops for training purposes has been a routine exercise since the 1960s. But in 1983, Moscow has reason to follow the autumnal maneuvers with particular suspicion. This year, NATO relocates 40,000 troops in Europe and 16,000 are flown in from the US in silent missions. In early November, the command post exercise Abel Archer follows. Its scenario? NATO responds to poison gas attacks by its enemy with a nuclear strike. It also practices new procedures of nuclear release. There is evidence that Moscow misunderstood Abel Archer as the initial phase of an imminent nuclear attack. An officer in the British military mission later reports that Soviet backfire atom bombers, seen here in original footage of their takeoff, had been stationed in East Germany during Abel Archer. Was it just a routine stopover? Or were the bombers ready for a counterattack? Abel Archer is going to plan. Then, a double agent sends reports about flash telegrams in Moscow saying NATO bases were on alert. The West recognizes the misunderstanding and reacts. The agent who warns NATO is Oleg Gordievsky, a colonel in the KGB and a mole for the British Secret Intelligence Service. He has been betraying secrets since 1974. The Abel Archer crisis makes him famous. There was great danger that bad decisions would be made. With intercontinental ballistic missiles, which take just 30 minutes to reach the other side, there's no time to think or to conduct an organized decision-making process. Since the early 80s, the Kremlin's fear of a first strike by NATO has been growing. Yuri Andropov, the terminally ill General Secretary of the Communist Party, orders the secret services to look for evidence that the West is preparing a war. Moscow readies its nuclear arsenal, as classified US documents prove. The number of redacted passages suggests that Abel Archer was not as harmless as Washington still makes it out to be. Gordievsky was able to plausibly explain and convey the dilemma and the psychological state of those involved. That was his real achievement, describing what was going on in the apparatuses and in people's minds, making clear that the Soviet leaders were frightened and concerned and needed to be treated with consideration to prevent fatal decisions. NATO takes Gordievsky's message seriously and abandons certain parts of Abel Archer. In 1985, Gordievsky comes under suspicion. He flees Moscow by train and is smuggled into the West by the British Secret Service. Today, he is living near London. 
Among the many defectors in the Cold War who went from the East to the West, Gordievsky was one of the few we can ascribe idealistic motives to. He really did want to keep the peace for both sides and avert a catastrophe. Jeffrey Carney sees himself as a traitor for peace as well. He sees the NSA deliberately creating confusion within a nuclear power as reckless. When he comes under suspicion, he disappears and assumes a new identity with the help of the East German State Security Service. Living as Jens Carney in East Berlin, he is captured by US agents in 1991. To this day, he is convinced he has done the right thing. Many people were not aware back then how close to the brink we were. Why should I regret something like this? A journey back to the atomic age, to when the world stood at the brink of destruction. Nigel Dunkley is visiting the site of a former storage facility for nuclear warheads. Fantastic. Fantastic. Amazing. The crane runway to transfer the warheads is very well preserved. An air conditioning system provided a constant storage temperature. We are at the special weapons site Linda Stolzenhain, one hour south of Berlin. The site used to be a restricted area and was closely guarded. To military missions, it was unattainable. Stolzenhain provided space for 328 nuclear warheads in two identically structured bunkers. In the ground, there are mountings to anchor the nuclear weapons. Each storage facility has 164 anchoring points. Four points per warhead. So there were 41 warheads in one depot. To be underground in a storage facility of Soviet nuclear warheads, over 300 of them, over 300 of them, when you think of the combined destructive power of so many warheads, that is absolutely shocking. It is stunning. It, it, it is... It's extraordinary. Manfred Müller, the bunker guide, appears conspicuously well-informed, and Dunkley wonders why. And so I asked him, I said, Manfred, uh, what were you? And he said, well, ich war Major. I was a Major. And I said, well, that's interesting. Ich war auch Major. I was a Major too. And then we both laughed, and we both realized that we must have been exact contemporaries, but exact opposites. So we were opposite each other. He was, for me, potentially a very dangerous person in those days. But here we were, laughing, talking, and the nice thing was being very friendly with each other. Two former enemies who are now friends. I think that's fantastic. Thank you for the information. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Unfortunately, their friendship only lasts for a short time. A few months later, Manfred Müller dies. Minsk in Belarus. Fashionable clothes and international brands of car are everywhere to be seen. 40 years ago, when Vladimir Paskalev reported for duty in West Germany, it was very different. He is a driver for the Soviet military mission. Having been thrown into the hustle and bustle of a Western consumer society, he chauffeurs officers on their reconnaissance missions. He doesn't think of himself as a spy. I wouldn't say we spied on one another. We observed one another, and we kept in touch with the high command of Soviet forces in Germany. Who could we observe anyway? We only monitored troop movements, as we had no access to restricted areas. Aged 21, he arrives in Bunda, Westphalia, the site of the Soviet military mission, or Soxmis, 
in the British sector. His main task consists of reconnaissance missions. They have become routine in the conflict between two blocks that don't trust each other. Paskalev's superiors are officers in the Soviet military intelligence service. Their mission mirrors those of the British, the French and the Americans in East Germany. Cold War routine. Today, Paskalev is heading to a meeting with a former comrade. Myodya, in the Belarus countryside, three hours from Minsk by car. Sergei Sidorenko is expecting Paskalev. The two have made contact via the internet almost 40 years after their time in Germany. Sergei used to be a driver as well. He was with the mission in Frankfurt. Today he is in a wheelchair as he lost his leg after a stroke. A great misfortune that forced the long distance truck driver into retirement. His photo album reminds him of a better time when they were driving fast cars through Germany. Did the police constantly chase you too? Yes, British military police always followed us. Just like Western missions did in East Germany, the Soviets operate within sight of counterintelligence. This is a surveillance video filmed in Frankfurt. A few years earlier, it could have been Sidorenko behind the wheel. US military police are waiting at the gate. All of a sudden, they take off at full speed. The car chase is on. The Soviet missions are suspected of conducting intelligence operations as well, such as using dead drops to pass on classified material. However, there is no proof of this. These car chases are familiar to Sidorenko, who finds them to be a nuisance. This photograph shows him in 1979 near Munich. Soon after, he will find himself with a gun to his head as German armed forces stop him. His officer had been trying to take pictures of an anti-aircraft system. For hours, he and his officer are trapped before the Americans rescue them from their predicament. Of course, we were scared. Especially when that officer from the German army was pointing his gun at me. I thought, that's it, I'm going to be shot. And my, up until that point, short life passed before my eyes. Lawrence G. Kelly is exploring terrain near Neustrelitz. Former forester Erich Gebauer provides him with orientation. In 1984, on this country road, Kelly scored his biggest coup. It's the time of the so-called rearmament in West Germany. In response to the Soviet SS-20, NATO deploys Pershing II missiles. Their nuclear warheads threaten targets as far as Moscow. The nuclear confrontation in the middle of Europe intensifies. The Soviets respond to the Pershings. Night convoys in East Germany spell trouble. Kelly encounters one of those at the time. I attempted to call out the VRNs, the license plate numbers, for the vehicles in the column, but there were none. The column was transporting cylindrical environmental canisters 
with very prominent longitudinal ribs. And those ribs were the primary signature feature for the scaleboard system. The SS-12 scaleboard is a well-known missile model, but it has not been seen in East Germany before. The SS-12 has a range of 560 miles, enough to pose a nuclear threat to Pershing II sites in West Germany. Kelly is taking pictures of the ominous canisters from his tour's moving car. He expects the Soviets to force him off the road any second, yet they don't react. It is only later that it becomes clear how important his photographs were. They were actually the first ground-level shots taken of this component of the weapon system at all, at least in the West. The public does not see the ribbed canisters of the SS-12 scale board until they leave East Germany in 1987. One year earlier, US President Ronald Reagan and Soviet General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev had agreed to eliminate all intermediate range ballistic missiles from Europe in the INF Treaty. Not only the SS-12, but also the Pershing II and SS-20 missiles were destroyed. Yet despite the policy of detente at the highest level, the spying war continues. Robert Hansen ranks as one of the most serious traitors in the history of US intelligence services. It takes until 2001 for the FBI to expose and arrest him. Hansen holds a key position in US counterintelligence, a dream position for a KGB mole. Hansen is also a uh, gläubiger Katholik. Hansen is a devout Catholic. He attends church, has a family and several children, and is a devoted father. None of that fits the pattern. Traitors usually have broken biographies. Somebody who has divorced three times and is an alcoholic would be more typical. Mere greed is what drives the supposedly upright citizen. He begins his lucrative double dealing in 1979. The investigative authorities estimate that over the years he has received $1.4 million in payment. As an intelligence professional, Hansen knows the pitfalls of the business and avoids them. The Soviets didn't know who he was until he was arrested. He never met with anybody. He was extremely cautious and very clever. That's why it took so long to find him. Hansen's arrest is a shock to US counterintelligence. He disclosed the position of secret bunkers for the government and information about operations against the KGB. His worst betrayal, however, was revealing CIA sources in the Soviet Union and thereby sending these informants to their doom. Being this cold-blooded, without showing any external signs and committing such a crime, make him the perfect criminal. He should have been sentenced to death, but narrowly avoided this fate by providing comprehensive testimony. Hansen is sentenced to 15 consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Aldrich Ames is serving a life sentence as well. In exchange for several million dollars in blood money, he sends US agents in Moscow to their death, yet he shows no remorse. As I get in my car, as I walk in my house, as I put on an expensive suit, do I have an awareness of blood guilt? No, no, I didn't. He shows no sympathy for those he has betrayed, even as they are executed by the KGB. To Ames, death is an occupational hazard for top spies. One of those who was executed was Aldolf Tolkachev, a radar specialist. He gives away information about the electronics of the latest Soviet missiles and jets. General Dmitry Polyakov is executed as well. He was a top informant for the CIA. Ames also exposes Oleg Gordievsky, who narrowly escapes the KGB. Aldrich Ames has got blood on his hands, blood of those 10 
about uh, Soviet officials who died, executed by the KGB as a result of his betrayal. Ames and Hansen, men without scruples. To them, it's all about money, not about status or matters of conscience. As East Germany celebrates the 40th anniversary of the Democratic Republic, its fall is imminent. Gorbachev presses East Berlin to implement reforms. He makes it clear to the SED that Moscow will no longer employ its troops against the groundswell of revolt in East Germany. The crucial question remains whether East German security forces would take up arms to save the Republic. Will the GDR's leadership risk open conflict with Moscow? West Germany's Federal Intelligence Service sends an all-clear signal to Bonn, drawing on sources in East Berlin that have not been revealed to this day. It showed how dependent the GDR and its SED leadership was. They were not allowed to make such a decision themselves, but received orders from Moscow not to shoot. The very moment that order was issued and leadership followed it, it was basically all over. On November 9th, the wall comes down. The paralyzed regime watches on as their people's desire for freedom becomes overwhelming. This is our time at last, the time for freedom. Germany is on its way to reunification. The Cold War is ending. And the withdrawal of hundreds of thousands of soldiers starts, in the east as well as in the west. With the reunification of Germany in October of 1990, the era of the Allied military missions ends as well. Back in Belarus, in Sergei Sidorenko's garden, this countryside idyll does not seem quite right for him. During his time with the Soviet military mission in Germany, he was always on the road, as he was later as a long-distance truck driver. Today, he is in a wheelchair. He got to know Lawrence G. Kelly via the internet. They share memories of their service in the missions. I did not expect a high-ranking officer of the American military mission such as Kelly, to establish contact with me, a soldier of the Soviet mission. I am very happy to have found such a friend. Sergei Sidorenko is back on the road. His new wheelchair has restored some of his freedom. It was a Christmas present from veterans of the American and the British missions, organized by Lawrence G. Kelly. A gesture of solidarity between former members of the Reconnaissance Corps with a diplomatic passport. A gesture that goes beyond old enemy lines. Whether they were weapons scouts, spies, traitors by conviction or greed, they all acted as informers in the service of two superpowers, the US and the Soviet Union. Many risked their lives and some even lost theirs, but most of them contributed to security during the Cold War through reconnaissance, espionage, and even through betrayal. For nothing is more dangerous in the atomic age than to know nothing about your potential enemy.